I'm really interested about what I find very humorous with uh, the title of the piece, firstly, is Closed Circuit. And if I look back into the history of when the Closed Circuit, circuit has appeared in yeah. the 60s, yeah. it was a kind of, from the perspective of cultural workers, it was believed to be this utopian media where everyone would be able to do their own media and the media would not be led by governments or centralized and so on and so yeah, forth. So did right. you use this yeah. title as a sort of an irony of well, that not, ideology? It's not as direct as that. There is a link, but it's less direct. So the link really is part of that m moment, I think, when um, yeah, there was that idea about kind of independent media, guerrilla filmmaking, all of that kind of thing, um, was also there was also this sort of you know idea about a kind of holistic approach to the relationship between humans and media and machines really mm -hmm. you know kind of s sort of cybernetic utopianism mm -hmm. um, and you know people like Stuart Brand for example mm -hmm. uh, in the 60s you can see there's a really you know there's a very clear link in something like the, uh, the whole earth catalogue where he's you know there's a sort of kind of independent free thinking hippie thing going on in the west coast of America mixed up with this sort of um, uh, you know machinic you know new sort of then what was then new media um, and computer media sort of use in, 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 in our lives in a way that you know was going to transform lives in an optimistic way um, so maybe the, the original idea of closed circuit somehow embedded in all of that and actually, of course, you know, what happened for me and what, what interests me about, about where that went and is directly related to this piece is how, in a way, I think we sort of really need to rethink that cybernetic utopian moment and actually really understand how actually all of those feedback devices um, and, um, and all of that, what, 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 um, what uh, uh, M. Catherine Hales calls a computational or computational ontology you know where in a way our every day is is, is regulated really mm. by by this but by, by by code really actually mm. manifest in all kinds of different ways sometimes actually manifest in social ways as well which i think is in a way most interesting um uh, that, that actually that's become a kind of regulatory regulatory framework for human life really for mm. human behavior um, and, and not at all, not at all actually um, liberating mm -hmm. in any way. In fact, quite the opposite. So in fact. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't, we don't even need to go near all of these things about, uh, you know, kind of self surveillance and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. Just at the kind of root of, of the practice of everyday life, I think. Just in the way that you walk through the streets, really, you're almost practicing this idea of a. You know, computational ontology, and and so and actually, it's that 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 the piece I want that through you know, I guess a kind of you know through 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 politics and through the social sphere and through media that I wanted to dig at a little bit. Mm. So it's basically a, a more linguistic interest in the sense that any sort of language becomes a machinery of a sort, especially when we're dealing with media speech. And this picture of politicians, yeah, which is highly coded. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That, that's exactly what happens, I think, in political speeches. Yeah, and it's exactly what happens um, in in a kind of mediatized situation where, and you can clearly see, you know, where where the politicians um, are are basically um, have, have have certain things that they want to say. They say them, um, and and they either won't say anything else, or they'll say the same thing, but. Re, uh, you know, kind of rewrought in a slightly different order. In fact, there was a fantastic example actually, um, very very recently, about a month ago, where the BBC leaked an interview with um, Ed Miliband. Ed Miliband is the um, <coughs> he's like the leader of the Labour Party, the shadow, mm -hmm. the non-government shadow main party in, mm -hmm. in the UK, and um, and actually he's quite a sort of sympathetic kind of character actually, and. Uh, and the interview was, was, was with him where the, the, was, was just a sort of headshot where the journalist asks him a question and he answers, he basically says what he wants to say and um, which is not related to the question in any way. So the journalist asks the question again but differently. So asks kind of a different question but along about the same subject. 
I can't even remember what it was. Mm -hmm. but, and he says exactly the same thing again. Not even, doesn't even change the words around. So he is, and, and, when you, and he does this five times. So when you see the video, it is actually like an automaton. Really, it's like watching an automaton. Someone just pressed play, and he just played. And there, wasn't any, there was nothing else to play. It was just those words, in that order, repeated. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, I think that's exactly the case. Um, uh, and, I think, and I think that's, uh, you know, what, and what's interesting about that particular example is one of the very few moments where you see that, you know, uh, happen. And actually, what we're so much more used to, you know, in the last decade, have actually been, you know, this kind of, you know, either, you know, I mean, if you th look at America, you know, in, in post rhetoric in America, either someone like Obama, who, th which there are uh, fragments from in, in, in this, and he sounds actually the most vacuous and the most preposterous, actually, you know, talking about our winter of discontent and, you know, this incredibly high rhetoric that really sounds like it belongs in the 19th century, well, I guess with Abraham Lincoln, which is where everyone says it kind of draws his inspiration from. So there's a, you know, on one hand in America there's that, and then on the other hand there's kind of Bush with his kind of faux, kind of folksy sort of, you know, approach to, you know, uh, let's, you know, have a war on terror with our with our pitchforks and sort of, you know, like <laughs> tractors or whatever, you know, with this, you know, home, kind of, these kind of homely okay. sort of way of doing it. Yeah, homely kind of way of doing it. But both of those things are actually just incredibly staged. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just, diff they're actually just different, different modes of rhetoric, really, mm -hmm. actually. So basically all the performance and what, especially what, um, in a sense, putting this critique in uh, a framework of an art piece would receive less attention of the public. It's not so populist or strong in that kind of sense. But at mm. the same time, it's interesting that it gives it a value of performance, per se, so that it's treated like an art performance where the formalist language is very well... well uh, yeah. every, the performers are very well aware of formal language that yeah. they have to use. Yeah. So it, there, there is a, a scenography, there's a yeah. screen, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah. all the words that are said are pre-set. There is no spontaneity or yeah, no life yeah. in it. Of course, yeah. So, um, there is no life in it, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all life is evacuated from it, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think making it as an artwork does a couple of things. The first thing is that actually it isn't just a critique of of you know, political rhetoric, it's actually much, I mean, it's like a kind of poem as well, actually, um, and a sort of, uh, a, a, a sort of poem that utilises some of the greatest moments of uh, political speeches in, in, the, in the last century. So, so there's that element to it as well. And, um, and I think the idea about, you know, the kind of feedback loop and the sort of, you know, the cycle of information and the dissemination of information and the way that it plays on us as an audience and how we are almost like the feedback devices, you know, where, the, where there are these kind of emotive triggers, you know, that, that are used in the rhetoric that have a sort of an effect on us. I think all of that actually is, is different. I, I think an art, art, as an artwork and, and displaying it in an art space is actually a really good way actually to explore the subtlety of all of mm -hmm. those things actually. And in a way, they're, they're kind of more interesting than, than the, just a the sort of broad sweeping, you know, critique. Because actually I'm not a conspiracy theorist. It's not, you know, there's nothing conspiratorial about these. It's more about, about a sort of statement of a contemporary ontology, really, of how things, how, how things are played out, really, and to understand them clearly, really, and to be clear about, about uh, you know, the mechanism which drives all these things, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, so in, in fact it always has been like that actually or every every um, um, period has adopted this and what I would be interested about uh, reenactments if you could talk about reenactments and especially if, if you take a look at where when in which time they had already been enacted for example in the Belle Epoque at the time there was a sort of neoism and reenactment of the old things so uh, one of the idea that has been put forward by many people already that we are living in a kind of designed Belle Epoque pre-war pre um, period that yeah. it, all these happenings of, then are um, to be um, expected, you know. So 
um, is how do you view like this an analogy between you know the reenactments in Belle Epoque and the reenactments nowadays? Uh, well, oh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think I think the, I, I mean I think the thing about I think you know reenactment is such a a broad term really that it needs a bit more a bit more definition. I mean, in, in you know I think there are all sorts of different types of of, of repetitions of things really for different purposes. And um, and they all feed into you know a, a kind of cultural understanding of what it means to repeat something. So so for example, you know, police in England very it's very common for the police to stage a reenactment of uh, a crime. So they employ actors who who restage the crime, and the point of the reenactment is is to jog the memory of witnesses. Mm -hmm. So the people who maybe saw the crime can remember, or at least this is what the police say. Um, uh, and there are television programmes dedicated to these things. So, the, so, so oddly, the, the reenactment itself becomes a kind of media spectacle and becomes something that um, you know, people watch for entertainment. You know, well, what, what they can reenact today? You know? Is it going to be that murder or this murder or which one? You know? um, so there, there's that kind of reenactment. You know? Then there's which on the which which on the you know on the face of it has a sort of utility about it, but then actually when you look closely, the utility seems very compromised by its value as entertainment as well. So it seems very you know a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. And then there are then there then there are people who who reenact um, you know battles in in the UK. This is a really big thing and something that I long about ten years ago when I started making work that used reconstruction and reenactment. I was very interested in. And they're like a sort of folk, they're, they're, it's a kind of folk practice, really. So it's like a kind of hobbyist, enthusiast folk practice where they dress up in their very precise and particular uniforms of whether they be uh, Romans or um, English Civil War reenactors or even World War II reenactors, I've seen. Um, and then they get kind of, you know, perform their sort of hobbyist you know, these hobbyist performances. And it's done, actually, in the, these reenactments are done mostly under the umbrella of um, heritage associations. So, for instance, there's a kind of a National Heritage Association um, that's this big charity that runs all of the old houses in, in England. And, um, and they are um, very often hosting these reenactment events. So they're seen as kind of part of the popular history of the nation, really, in the same way that you might go to the Tower of London or, um, or uh, you know, go and visit a, a, a stately home somewhere. Mm -hmm. They're part of that same thing. So they, again, are completely different. And the people doing them, um, you know, don't think that they are taking part in something that is this kind of very surreal and strange uh, um, uh, performance. You know, they, they, they just think this is something that they do. And they, I mean, I know both spoken to quite a number of people about uh, who, who do this kind of thing. So the, you know, there's that kind of reenactment as well. So there's so there's really a whole range of things. It's difficult. I think it's you know, and I think uh, I, I think it's and what 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 I, and what I saw ten years ago was the kind of possibilities of using these things in different ways, really, and extracting what bits I wanted from them, and then putting them together in some other way, really. Um, and then of course the other thing as well that that relates it very closely to you know contemporary art practice is the idea of or well, the sort of impossible you know the impossible idea. Of, of, a, of a repetition of a moment of history as well. Mm -hmm. That the idea that you can sort of somehow just do a rewind and a replay of something. And, and, there's, um, and, and, and the idea that that, that mediated moment, because that's generally what I deal with, those kind of moments that are somehow mediated, appears in front of you as a live moment. So something that what you knew as a representation, you knew as something that was, 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 was not live, not real, you know, something you understood through images, um, suddenly appears to you as a live thing. And that's, I think, a quite a strange experience to have, really, to present to people. Because um, it, kind of, it, it kind of implies that there is all the spontaneity and authenticity of a lived moment, when in fact there isn't, of course. It's a closed, dead moment where there's no spontaneity and there's no possibility for anything other than what we know will happen. Mm. So there's a question of whether to the old... Um, question of originality and genuinity in, in this, especially when we have like reenactments, which are, I know that you're not dealing basically so much with them, but there are a lot of interact 
um, reenactments from the conceptual art period yeah. because the conceptual mm. art is basically believed that it cannot be mediated yeah. in other ways by yeah. the the only by the the, the direct um, yeah. yeah experience of, yeah, of, yeah. of the work so. yeah yeah um, uh, yeah I don't know what it, yeah well that's another facet to the whole thing really mm. that um, again makes it impossible really to make any kind of general I mean I, I simply see that as yeah, it's an entirely different thing, you know, really, that I have no, no actual no relationship to at all. I mean, it seems to me like that's p kind of part of the museum industry, really, mm. that actually, you know, if you've made a, a very successful performance in the 1960s that, that you didn't really document very well, or, or you only have some still photographs, then, you know, that's not so great for, for generating a museum audience, but if you do the, react, if you do the performance again, then... Wow, that's going to create a, a gather a great audience. So you know, I'm sure there are reasons for doing that, and I'm being very glib, obviously, deliberately. Um, but but I'm sure there are very good reasons for doing it. But I mean, I I've never seen one. I have no interest in them. they mm -hmm. I you know, they're just something else, really. I mean, actually, I think that the moments where moments of life that are repeated outside the context of art are things that really interest me, actually, and then trying to pull them back into you know the you know the art, which is kind of essentially is is both a space of representation and also a space of reflection, you know, and a, and a, sp a space for thinking about something. So the idea that you can take something from the world and then you can examine it and and look at it and think about it seems to me a really proper place mm -hmm. for 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 art to be operating in. There's mostly for the politically critical artists. There there is a big decision of which topic they're going to pick and why. So there is a lot of art that would pick a very current idea or a current problem that appears, but that's why I find it um, not so strange, but maybe I'm really interested interested mm. in why you chose the Greenwich uh, bombing uh, um, yeah. Yeah, idea yeah. From, yeah. from a couple of years ago. Yeah. So why did you... That was done in 2006, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And yeah. what was the impetus behind it? Yeah, okay, so well that... Okay, so that piece was the sort of reconstruction of, of the media around the possible bombing, attempted bombing of Greenwich Observatory um, by a French anarchist in 1894. And I... Yeah, that, I mean, the thing about that piece is that, that there are a couple of things there. The first thing is that um, that came about through a collaboration with Tom McCarthy, the, the novelist and artist as well. And, um, and, and it, was, it was a thing that, it was an event that Tom was, already knew about and was interested in. And the connection between us, really, was, was through literature, was through, um, through Conrad's The Secret Agent. Which, which is a dramatisation, a novel is a dramatisation of the event. In fact, it's actually really the only reason that anybody knows about the event, actually, mm. because Conrad wrote this novel about it, um, which uh, is, is you, know, f f f you know, kind of um, the novel itself is, 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 is sort of narrates the popular conspiracies of the day, actually, mm. of, the, of, the, of, of the 1890s and what, what happened and why it might have happened. Mm. Um, and so that was really the starting point. But of course, the other thing that was interesting was for us was it seemed to be a a moment when um, Conrad, at least, had recognised that the observatory was a really was a very interesting, a very potent um, symbolic target to be bombed. That its value wasn't economic. It wasn't. Um, you know, it wasn't uh, uh, about destroying lives. It was actually about the d a destruction of a symbol, basically, because the observatory was a um, at that time was a very well known symbol of of science generally, and more specifically, of course, of astronomy. But not only astronomy, also of the Greenwich Meridian Line, which only ten years before had become a global meridian line, as opposed to the English meridian or, or British meridian line. So, so, you know, it had a kind of enormous potency as a symbolic target to blow up time, basically, to blow up the home of time. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Tom and I thought that was an interesting uh, starting point. And obviously the parallel, there were obviously direct parallels with what happened, you know, you know what happened on September the 11th, which obviously was a, also an attack 
on what was what I suppose we could say was you know the most potent symbolic target that you could possibly imagine you know buildings that represented global capital which was I mean Conrad's word for the observatory was that it represented the sacrosanct fetish of the day the thing that everybody really cared about the thing that really mattered as a building it's pretty domestic and uninteresting to look at you know but it was a symbolic value so you could say exactly the same about the the twin towers that they represented you know the sacrosanct fetish of the day you could transpose mm -hmm. conrad's words pretty much onto that onto that moment so, so for so for us there was a link actually with contemporary events but it was kind of interrupted through you know through this historical moment that that uh, that seemed to be parallel in some kind of ways. And um, what that allowed us to do, I guess, was then to look at all the media that was produced during that, during that time, in the 1890s, in 1894, 1895, immediately after the, um, bomber, the attempted bomb attack. There was, of course, no bomb attack. Um, and, and to see very clearly, and to include in the installation, all of the media that actually almost identically reproduces the same narratives that, ha that, 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 that were very prevalent immediately after um, September the 11th. So there are things like, for instance, um, um, you know, the idea that, uh, that, that the bombers are kind of foreigners, you know, they're other, they're coming here, they're, you know, like parasites kind of, you know, hosting, being hosted in our country, then trying to destroy it. There's that kind of narrative. That's particularly the case with the bombing in London that happened actually while we were making the piece, because though they were, um, um, you know, UK citizens, they were as English and as British as I am. So, so, um, so that's very, you know, that narrative is very, very parallel there. Also, the other other kinds of things that we found in in, in the in the newspaper reports and other material from the time in eighteen in the eighteen nineties, kind of you know, in the archive of the Collendale Muse uh, Museum, were. Things like, for instance, a journalist going to the Patent Museum and um, ask, uh, signing in anonymously and trying to find information about explosives to see how easy it is to get information to make a bomb, to do something you know, bad with. And he realises it's very, very easy to get this material. And so the article in the uh, Pall Mall Gazette, I think it was, is kind of saying, you know, what the patents office should be much more difficult to get into you shouldn't you should have to show some ID or you know something you know it should be restricted basically who who should have access to this information and you only need to change the patent office for the internet and you have exactly the same discourse today really um, so there are loads of, you know there are loads and loads of things uh, there are loads and loads of things like that where there were these kind of parallel narratives parallel news narratives I guess actually uh, running through the media in the 1890s and then running through the 21st century as well, 21st century media as well. And um, to the point, you know, where there was this, um, and this was an entirely coincidental thing, that, that when we, we, we made the piece in, uh, the, the, did the archive research in, in July 2005, about, about two weeks after the bombings on the London Tube. And my studio is um, in the, um, I'm just talking and talking here. And my, my studio is, um, at the end of the Northern Line, the Collendale Library, where this stuff is, is at the very, at the very, uh, at the very end of the Northern Line, and it's really long. It's an hour and a half journey on the tube, and that summer nobody was travelling on the tube because no, just after the bombings, so the tube carriages were empty, which is a rare occasion for London. It's actually quite nice to travel on an empty tube, um, even if you do think you might get blown up. And um, and but but obviously people had been travelling on the tube. And as they do in London, they kind of they leave these free papers or, and, and also papers like the Evening Standard all over the carriages. And it was a kind of long, boring journey. So, you know, so we would go up on the train, on the tube, and we would be reading these, these newspaper stories. And the same, we, then we'd get to the Colondale, you know, and they were all about, I, I mean, I have, you know, new terror laws, all this kind of stuff, you know, new law about immigration, new law for for holding terrorist suspects, new powers to the government to, you know, crack down on potential terror, terror plots. Those are the kinds of things. I mean, I have a whole list of them. Um, we'd get to the Collendale, and under the microfiche, 
would see the same headlines from a hundred years earlier. And it was really shocking. It was very shocking, actually. Mm -hmm. to, to, and they were obviously a complete coincidence. And from that point on, you know, Tom and I'd be walking around London and past, you know, kind of hoardings and, and sort of uh, news agents selling papers, you know. And Tom, you know, Tom was so many Tom just went, oh, look, there's our, there's our, there's our piece, you know, on the front page of today's newspaper. Again, you know, like every day, really. And this went on and on for months, you know. It's actually really similar to what you're doing with closed circuit because if you look at the papers from Stalinist Russia or even China nowadays or 30 years yeah. earlier, there was the same kind of prescriptive language that would be used constantly in all the news. So actually, uh, as far as I know, for example, for well-read Chinese, they... Uh, would go through the paper and then underline two sentences, which were basically the information, or the rest of it was right, rhetoric. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's really telling us that um, it does not change much. And yeah. um, since we have the media, it doesn't matter which kind of form of media we have, whether it be newspaper or television, it yeah. still adopts the same kind of code. Yeah. What I'm in interested now is how you think about installing. The piece you have obviously so much research mm -hmm. behind this, and how can you mean this piece? Yeah, you for this piece and also the piece yeah. previously. How how you d deal with representational tools? Because yeah. obviously representational tools are a part of the same yeah. consensus yeah. that are actually in contemporary art pretty much similar and also prescribed as yeah. in, in the yeah. Media. Well, each piece really get, ends up you know being configured actually in the way that um, it seems that it needs to be in order to do the job that it has to do. So in this, in this piece, you know, the teleprompters are really important because they, on the one hand, convey to you the necessary information that you need to sort of, in a sense, you know, uh, kind of in a way reinstate the lack of context that is evident in the, in the actors speaking. But at the same time, as objects themselves, mm -hmm. They're they are part of that staging of the press conference and the and, and actually they're a key part of the staging of it because they're the bit where you think that you have eye contact with the politician because they're you know they're looking straight through their auto cue making eye contact with you you think but of course not actually reading the lines you know that possibly contains this very emotive language telling them about how much they care for you. Um, and of course they're not looking at you at all, they're just reading their lines that someone else wrote. Mm -hmm. so, so actually they're really key objects in terms of the staging of, of press conferences and, and political briefings and political speeches. So that's why I wanted to include mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. really. It seemed like the natural thing to do to, to include them, or the logical thing to do, I should say, to include them. Um, and, um, and, and, and yeah, then position them so they face the um, actors, so there's a sort of split, so you almost you have a dual experience of the piece, mm -hmm. so you can kind of um, have this moment where you're sort of immersed in the, in the piece, and then on the other hand, when you see the prompter, you're sort of thrown out of it. I mean, I was interested in, in kind of Brack's ideas, really, about mm -hmm. performance, and mm -hmm. the idea, he talks about being in the flow of the performance, when you're kind of immersed, which of course is exactly what politicians want us to be, they want us to be in the flow of their performance, mm -hmm. and then being kind of in above the flow of the performance, when in a sense you have obviously the implication of a sort of plan, you have a kind of an idea of, of the mechanics really of how this thing is playing out. And so that, the, the, yeah, the piece really, quite literally splits, you know, into those two kinds of ways of, of thinking about the experience of the, of the video. And the audience actually um, comes into this gap that is split between yeah. the politician and the text that one reads, so you, yeah. you extinguish basically the possibility of getting manipulated by it because it's all um, basically demystified. You know, it opens up this gap. But yeah, and also the audience is put in a place actually of, 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 of a, in an impossible place where they're, they're, they're not in the place of the audience, which would of course be on the mm -hmm. other side of the teleprompter, mm -hmm. and they're also not in the place of the politicians because there are the politicians. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of in between, that they are literally in the middle of the mechanics, really, mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the logic for, for staging that in, in, in that way, so that piece. And I think each piece, you know, is staged in really different ways. Milgram, 
uh, piece that I made, for example, um, which was live performance of, of Stanley Milgram's Beatles to Authority. I, you know, I, I spent a long time talking actually with Steve Rushton, who I wrote the script with of this, about how to stage that piece. And in the end, you know, the thing we described, the thing we decided was it was so important that the that the audience were forced into a position to be voyeurs, so that so the space that the actors performed in had to be closed off, and we needed surveillance windows all the way around it, which actually was exactly how Milgram's laboratory was 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 um, staged. But of course, of course, we could have taken away a wall, or we could have made it in a different way, but what we thought was actually what we wanted was to place the audience outside of this, to create this, this distance between them and the actors and to make them, you know, basically turn them into voyeurs. And because of what, what they're watching is like a mock execution, really. Yeah. Um, so, so that was, you know, again, you know, in that piece it was really, you know, just about thinking through, you know, what, what the ideas that we were dealing with demanded and what, the ne what, what was necessary in order for those ideas to be realised in the most, you know, coherent way possible and I think what happens is then you kind of it generates some sort of aesthetic off the back of it but that's in a way that's a sort of byproduct of the piece really mm -hmm. it's not something that I set out to try and do really I mean I think that the teleprompters are really amazing objects actually mm -hmm. you know and they use I mean they use a they use a a, a, a system that is called in uh, in museum in museum kind of uh, um, uh, uh, in museums, they, they use a thing called it's called Pepper's Ghost, and it's an old Victorian trick, just to mm -hmm. kind of create a kind of holographic mm -hmm. view of, of an object or a person. So, um, so they're really you know they're brilliant in as much as they um, they are actually literally a trick, an optical trick that was developed in the Victorian times, and here it is being used in twenty first century by politicians. Mm -hmm. I had no idea they were still used. I thought, yeah, the peppers go. Yeah, that's what, actually, but that's yeah, what they yeah, are. Yeah. They're a I glass. saw it. It's a half mirrored glass plate, mm -hmm. where so that when you look in it, you see what's underneath reflected, but kind of in hanging in space. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so it's a Victorian trick. The first idea of hologram, right? Yeah, the first idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I mean, the illusion. Yeah, and that's why yeah, it's so yeah, even even yeah. it has another implication yeah. because it's one of the first illusions. Yeah. Yeah. Trick. The trick to trick the audience. Because, it's yeah. to trick the audience. Mm. Okay. To make them believe how is that ghost there? Mm -hmm. You know, the politicians are there using it. So yeah, it has to be there in that in the gallery. It's mm -hmm. you know, key really. Mm. So. Okay, I think we are going yeah. to enjoy the illusion today in the evening. So really thank you very much for Great. this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.